So we'll start the slideshow um, and I'll just sort of walk you through it. Um, it's not supposed to be an overly complicated section, but there's a lot that's in here. <clears throat> some of it is kind of coloring book really simple and some of it, well, it's still kind of simple, but it can be tedious and lengthy. So um, that's one of the things about um, the rest of the course. So if you've survived chapter six, you've survived probability, and if you survive counting techniques, the rest of the course isn't really that bad. So this is supposed to be closer to the beginning of the course. So chapter two deals with not just representation of data, but data in the form of single variable stats. Data itself is not very meaningful unless it's represented uh, graphically or statistically. Uh, statistics is the gathering, organization, analysis, and presentation of numerical data. Uh, it originated in Sweden and uh, in the 1700s. So statistics refers to the state, because that's where the word stat in statistics comes from. It refers to the state. It's often called political arithmetic. It was something governments did to know their citizens and still do. They still do to this day. But today, we can also gather data and do statistics to see what politicians are up to. We can gather police data. We can gather, gather crime data. We can uh, gather data on, you know, all sorts, of, all sorts of things that the government knows, including what the government knows about us. So Statistics Canada, for example, is a whole branch of government which deals in uh, all the statistics governing all the aspects of Canadian life and commerce. So that's that. Uh, now, some terminology is in, is in order because we're dealing with data here in terms of statistics. So raw data is unprocessed data upon which no statistics has been performed. So let's say I took the height of every one of you in class and I wrote down, I didn't have to write names or whatever. Maybe I note whether you're a boy or a girl or whether you're, you know, whatever. So, you know, maybe, and, and then I would just record your height, heights without recording your name. Well, that's known as raw data. Nothing was done to that data. I didn't average anything. I didn't do any math on it. I just wrote the numbers down as I saw them um, uh, as I was doing the measuring. A variable is a quantity being measured, so a person's height would be a variable. Um, or the number of hits to a website, or the number of viewers to a television program. There's two kinds of variables, continuous and discrete. Continuous is where it's like a continuous function. Well, that's what continuous data is. It's data which varies along a, an unbroken continuum. And a really good example is a person's height. Of course, it varies along an unbroken continuum. Those are continuous variables. Uh, time to do a task. Time is continuous too. Uh, the speed of a runner or the speed of a car. These are continuous variables as well. Discrete. Now discrete, well, you know, you did a whole, you just did a whole unit in discrete math. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 had to do with the mathematics of integers. It was all about whole numbers the whole time, right? You had, especially chapters 4 and 5, everything about it was about whole numbers. So that's what we mean by discrete, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we don't look at any numbers in between. Well, if I'm counting the number of people in class, it doesn't make sense to have, you know, 24 and a half kids in class. It's either 24 or it's 25. It's not in between. There is no in between between two integers that are next to each other. That's discrete. Now, sometimes you can fudge with that rule a little bit and allow halves, half steps or quarter steps or decimals or something. Um, in that case, like, for example, shoe size, you know, you can have seven, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, nine, nine and a half. These are all valid shoe sizes. And um, so those are allowed to be discrete too. So you have the number of people in class, you have things like shoe sizes. Um, 
or numbers on a dice roll, the outcome of a dice roll, one, two, three, four, five, six. Obviously, you can't roll two and one third or whatever. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so that's the difference between continuous and discrete. Now, uh, here's an example of raw data. Here, I, I don't know, I had nothing better to do with my time. So, no, I, I, to be honest with you, I just made up these numbers. Okay, just, mm. and recorded the following. I'm a busy person. I really am. And recorded the following frequencies for each value. So I have here these dice dice roll values, which are down here, one, two, three, four, five, six. You have these frequencies. And we did a total of 600 dice rolls. So that means that the total of these frequencies must add up to 600. You can try it yourself. Just stop the video and see if those numbers add up to 600. Now this is called a tabulation of data, and it's one way to organize data. We can show frequency of data by means of a bar graph or a histogram. A bar graph is usually used for discrete data. It's where the bars are separated, they're far apart. A histogram is where the bars are together. Okay, so that when, when they stick together, we often imply continuous data. And so here's a, an example of a bar graph in Excel. The, da the data table you see there is just the same data as in the last slide. Uh, again, with the same data as in the last slides, um, this is the same kind of bar graph, except that this one isn't under Excel, it's under Google Sheets. Um, my preference, because I'm, I'm not assuming everyone has Microsoft Office on their laptops or their computers, I'm gonna assume everyone has access to Google and we will be doing our assignments and so so on for chapter two on Google Sheets. Here's a frequency polygon. Uh, the frequency polygon in Google Sheets is what a frequency polygon would look like of the same data. This is the same data as on the last slide. You see this slide here, you see the tops of those bars, the tops of those bars here, they're all, you know, they're all the corners and elbows and endpoints of this broken line up here. Not a broken line or bent line, I guess. We call that a frequency polygon. We don't really call it a broken or bent line. Uh, this is called a frequency polygon. Um, and a cumulative frequency polygon is where you take the same numbers as over here, except you keep adding them together. So here is the same table with the same dice values and frequencies. But here we go with the frequencies being added up. So 115 is 115 in the cumulative frequency. The first value is always the first value. And so here's where 115 is located. And then the next value isn't 79, it's 115 plus 79. That's 194 and you can see that number is close to 200. 194 plus 92 is 286. And you can see that's almost 300 over here. 286 plus 85 is 371. 371, that's almost 400. That's over here. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and then 371 plus 108 is 479, right over here. And 479 and 121 finally is 600. Notice I said earlier that I was going to roll the dice 600 times. And... Um, it turns out that the very last data point on a cumulative frequency polygon is is actually the data size. So the first the first number in the cumulative frequency is actually the first data point in the frequency. The last data point in the cumulative frequency is actually the data size. So those are two two things you should know about all cumulative cumulative frequency diagrams. Um, so Okay, this is um, this is where it gets kind of long. Okay, the group data example fully solved and explained. For me to go into it, I do have a separate uh, for people who don't know how to use spreadsheets. I do have a separate video on how to use a spreadsheet. I will post that uh, as well on the timeline. Uh, but this one is for group data fully solved and explained, and we have a hospital. A uh, team of nurses took the temperature of patients in each of their wards. High body temperature can be linked to, to many different things like the flu or lots of things actually, but one of them is COVID-19. 
Uh, but lots of infectious diseases that are not COVID-19 could also come with the fever as well, or chills. So what we want to do for this slideshow is to do two things. Set up a data table for the frequency histogram. We're going to be making a frequency histogram. The problem is um, it's kind of hard to do with a spreadsheet. With a spreadsheet, we're going to end up making a bar graph, but okay, so that's all we can do. Uh, if you were actually using a graph paper and a ruler and a pen or a pencil, uh, you could actually make a frequency histogram a lot more easily. We're going to have five bins. It's grouped data, okay? Notice, look, look, at that, look at that table over here. Look how much data there is. There's a lot of data here. It's 90 data points. A lot of them are, a lot of patients had the same temperature. And by the way, notice I did something nice for you. I sorted the numbers in numerical order. Makes it easier to count that way. But it won't matter on a spreadsheet because it doesn't matter how the data was. You can actually use the spreadsheet to uh, do all the counting for you. You don't have to worry about ordering the data. But um, if we were in a real classroom uh, and I would, uh, I would ask you to do this by hand, eh, it would take about, it would be about good, good, 20, 25 minute question, well, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. To do these two things, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if I had, um, uh, you know, for this kind of a table. But so we're setting up a data table for a frequency histogram. Obviously, we're going to draw one. But all the other part, we're not going to do. We're not going to compute the average body temperature. That'll be for another slideshow. Uh, that's where we do single variable statistics. We're not going to go there yet. We're just going to do a frequency histogram and show you how that's done using group data. Notice uh, group data is the kind of thing you do when you have A, you have a lot of data like we do here in this table, and B, the data is continuous, preferably continuous. The other option, you could use it on discrete data. You could uh, if the range of the values is very large. Okay, so um, first we need to find a maximum and minimum value. Well, lucky for us, because this data is in numerical order, the minimum value is 96.7. The maximum value is 99.4. So we don't have to worry there. Temperature is continuous data, so that we need to group the data into bins. To avoid more work than necessary, you know, you don't have to do like 10 bins or whatever. Just do five. In fact, I, I would prefer that you didn't do more. Um, more is, it doesn't really get you a whole lot more accuracy. It kind of does, but it, the payoff isn't great. But then if you do too few bins, then you have bigger problems. Your error becomes greater. So five seems to be that magic number where it's not too much, you know, you're, Six, seven, eight bins, you're making too much work for yourself anyway. Five bins, it's that happy medium, okay? Now, what the heck is a bin? A bin is a word we use for the word subrange, right? So we have a range of data. The range of data goes from 96.7 to 99.4 in our sample. But a subrange are ranges of numbers inside those, um, those uh, values. So the range is really... 99.4, the highest, minus the lowest, 96.7. And we end up with the range being 2.7 degrees. So we need five bins, so we got to divide 2.7 degrees by five, and we get 0 0.54. Now, on Google Sheets, we're going to refer to values in raw data referring to specific cell addresses on the spreadsheet. The max value is at cell I10. So that's, here's column I and we go all the way down to 10. You can see that. That's the max value. The min value is A1. It's over here on the other end. Uh, excuse me, the range is given by subtraction. And notice that means that we're taking I10 and subtracting A1. And that's kind of what we're saying here. And if this was column L down here, then L3 would be 1, 2, 3. That would be where the, the range goes. Your 2.7 is there. And that's because this formula 
is doing the calculations, so you don't have to. Uh, we divide the range by the number of bins to get the bin width. So the number of bins is just a number you enter. We already know it's 5, so you just type the number 5 in there. The bin width is L3. What's L3? L1, L2, L3. Here's L3 divided by L4. 2.7 divided by 5. And you can see the result of that calculation, 0.54. Try these, try these sorts of calculations and formulas yourself. All the formulas have to have equal signs in front of them. That's really important, okay? They have to have equal signs in front of them. Otherwise, you're, you know, you're not going to have much uh, to look at on your spreadsheet. So uh, now we'll move into the stage of computing frequencies. You can kind of ignore these midpoints. These midpoints aren't all that useful until later. But actually, uh, I did at the end of the at the end of this slideshow, I did find a use for them. They're going to be uh, for our x-axis actually. Um, Although that isn't quite what you're supposed to do with them, but well, we'll use it for that since they're available. The um, the frequency maybe I should have used low and then the high value. I'm not sure. So the frequencies are just how often. So these numbers refer to how many values in this table here occur between 96.7 and 97.24. So we're looking in between those two values and we're counting. How many values fall between 96.7 and 97.24? The next value, the next frequency, 12, is the number of values occurring between 97.24 and 97.78. We keep going down. These numbers here in this column under the frequency should add up to 90. You can, I didn't actually try it myself, although you know what? I'm going to do it right now. And uh, I'm going to show you the value. So I can use the word sum, S-U-M and open a bracket and then select that range and then close my bracket and then yes in fact I have 90 so that that's actually quite encouraging the fact that I have 90 there uh, tells me that um, I did these formulas correctly that that's what that tells me so um, now uh, let's take a look at low and high uh, the low and high columns. This is another thing too. So the low column, remember this first value under the low column is the very lowest value. It's the minimum value. It's this value up here under min. So what justifies this value here, 97.24? Where did that come from? Well, I took 96.7, added my bin width, and that's the number I got. So when I add 0.54, I got 97.24. I take that number, Sorry, I take that number, I copy it over here, and then I add 0.54 again. For But do I add 0.54? Well, I actually, I add the uh, cell address of 0.54, which turns out to be, um, what was it, L5. So if this, is, if this is column L, that's L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, because you remember I referred to it as column L back in this slide. So this is, this is still column L. I'm calling this column A, column B, column C, column D, even though that wasn't really the case in my spreadsheet. But A, B, C, D just makes it easier to think about. So if I'm, uh, if I want, basically I'm taking my A, A13, because this would be the 13th row, because remember the table is above the, the raw data table. This whole raw data table is above this table. So notice I go all the way to 10. And if you give me a few rows, I'll have 13 here. So 12, 13. So this is A13. This is B13. This is C13. This is D13. And so that's how you make sense of these um, cell addresses and these formulas. So here I'm adding B, A13 to B13 and dividing by 2. Well, when I add A13 to B13 and divide by 2, this is the number I get. That's called my midpoint. Okay, it's the average between the low and the high values of the same row. Let's move on. Computing the actual frequencies don't require midpoints. So when we're computing frequencies, we only worry about low and high. Okay? Um, we can use, basically to do this, we use this kind of cumbersome and really chaotic looking COUNTIF command. So please, when you use the COUNTIF command, um, you, you know, 
take note of the take note of the syntax uh, when you use it. Um, you know, worst comes to worst, you can just count them by hand. <laughs> you know, if you really feel a lack of confidence in using the countif formula, just count them by hand, right? If push comes to shove, right? So it turns out that there are 13 values between 96.7 and 97.24. Notice that I'm counting, I'm, I'm counting numbers that are less than whatever it is in cell B13, that's this guy, 97.24, less than or equal to 97.24. In the cell range A1 to A10, what's A1 to A10? This is A1 to A10, that was our original raw data. So basically we're looking in our raw data for numbers that are less than uh, 97.24. So if we look, we have 97.2 here, 90, and then it becomes 97.3. That obviously that's higher than 97.24. So we have 10 values going here, 11, 12, 13. So the number is correct. It is 13. So if we um, under D14, if we wanted to count them, well, we would count uh, A1 to A10 again. But then we're comparing against not. A, uh, B13, but B14, 97.78, and we get a frequency of 12. 12 uh, numbers occur. But how do we know that? 12 numbers occur between this and this, but I just used a less than or equal to up here, so how do I know? Like, why does it only have 12? It actually, if you try this, you're going to get 25. But what I did, it, what I did here is I subtracted 13, which happens to be in cell D13. I subtracted that and that's why I got a frequency of 12, which is correct. It is the frequency of 12. Um, so we're doing low, high, and then, um, well, we could have the midpoint, but we want the frequency, right? We want the frequency here, and that's that's the... Well, anyway, so how do we get low? Well, um, we take this value min. So min is under L2. Hold on. L2. So, so I just go equal sign L2, and I get 96.7, the same number that occurs here. Um, high is the number, well, high is the high within that bin, not the high that's in the whole table. So we need 96.7 and then we need to add 0.54. So, so here I'm going to do this. I'm going to take the value here, E13, and I'm going to add the bin width over here, right, L5. Okay, so that's 97.24. I'm not going to bother with the midpoint here, but we're just going to go with the frequency. So equals count if, count if, open bracket, and then we're taking this whole cell range, and I'm just going to select it with my mouse. And then comma, and I'm saying less than or equal to the high value, 97.24. But less than or equal to has to occur in quotes. Um, hold on. Less than or equal to. There we go. Close my quote, and then ampersand, and then the cell that I'm trying to do the comparison with and then close my bracket. So the frequency is 13 as you can see. Now I need to copy this cell over here. So I just did control C, control V. I guess that didn't quite work. Let's try this again. This is going to be F13. So equals F13. All right. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to do something sneaky because I'm going to get lazy. You notice I have E13 plus L5. I know I'm going to do E14 plus L5, right? Um, no, that's not going to work. So I, I'll, I'll do it longhand. Uh, e, E14. E14 plus L5. Okay. And then I, com I then copy 97.78 down here. And I go... E15 plus, oop, plus L5. 
that's 98.32. Oh, by the way, maybe I should uh, maybe I should do some frequencies here. This time I do countdown again, and then I go uh, the same cell range again, just highlighted I, I, A1 to I10, and then um, comma, and then less than or equal to, less than or equal to, close quote, ampersand, and this time we want 97.78 and close bracket but then I have to subtract the number above it I have to subtract my 13 and I'm just gonna click on that cell and I get my 12 so we keep doing this right we we keep doing this sort of thing so equals count if open bracket highlight comma and then less than or equal to ampersand um, 98.32 which is F 15 and then we subtract the two numbers above it oh sorry subtract the two numbers above it the 12 and we subtract the 13 as well so we get 27 we copy down the 98.32 98.32 is F 15 so I go equals F 15 and then over here I go equal sign E16, E16, um, plus the width, which we go over here, L5, and then we do that. So equal sign count if, and then highlight the cell range, comma, uh, less than or equal to, ampersand, 98.86 subtract all these numbers uh, 27 minus 12 minus 13 and there we go and then we also do what's this cell f16 so equals f16 and then we go equal sign uh, uh, what is it e e17 e17 uh, plus the bin width just click on the number and now we do equal sign count if and then we go um, cell range a1 to i10 comma um, less than or equals ampersand ampersand 99.4 and then um, subtract this minus this minus this minus this and we get 11 which sounds a little strange sounds a little strange I don't recall getting 11 did I get that in sheep too oh no I didn't okay never mind all right does it add up to 90 is the important question so equal sign sum does this add up to 90 did I do it right and 90 okay we did it okay so basically that is um, that is how you do a, a frequency histogram uh, I was um, thinking of uh, well I could use I could do a midpoint too, I suppose equal sign and this is where we go in brackets and we add these two numbers together at our low to our high right add them together in a bracket and divide by two so and we can carry this calculation all the way down and these are all midpoints so um, so if we're going to make a bar graph of midpoint versus frequency basically what we do is I believe we can go to insert and then chart and then a table comes up well we don't want a line chart we want this frequency versus mid and it looks like we got it looks like we got the whole thing and it's that fast to put together um, okay so notice that the midpoints are here and they're evenly spaced so uh, it's it serves just as well okay but uh, basically what you have here are uh, just different values so okay I'm going to um, I'm going to stop this now